The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and after he had sat down, his disciples came to him. He began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Blessed are they who hunger, and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they insult you, and persecute you, and utter every kind of evil against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. As announced at the beginning of Mass, this Sunday begins Catholic Schools Week. And so this Mass is dedicated to our Catholic school here in the parish. This is why we have our children's choir, our school children are serving, being the lectors, and so on. Many of our teachers are here, as well as you see other students too. The key is, what is so good about Catholic education? Granted, any education wants to enable a student to do well in this world with different skills. A good system of education wants to impart knowledge. But the key ingredient to Catholic education is we want to instill in students beatitude, a real sense of happiness, happiness that only God can give. Here in the Gospel today, the Beatitudes, which begins the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' longest public preaching, through which we'll journey up until the time of Lent, he presents this formula. It's really an education for all the disciples. Live the Beatitudes, and one will find real happiness. Happiness that only God can give. So here are principles. Think then. Jesus begins with, blessed are the poor in spirit. He's not talking about economic poverty or riches. He's not talking about the haves or the have-nots. He's talking about a fundamental relationship with God. God is God. God is the source of all life. God is love. God made us, each one of us, in his divine image. God has given us the very breath of life. God has willed that each one of us here is supposed to be here. And each one of us has a purpose in this world. How beautiful that is. In response, though, you and I are called to recognize God as the one true God. God is God. Here we are. And we're called then to know, to love, and to serve God in this life so that we can share everlasting life. This poverty of spirit, then, also generates an attitude of gratitude. Think how oftentimes people in our world are miserable because they focus on what they do not have and they focus on what others have. Instead, we need to recount all that God has given to us, our very life with all of our talents, our faith, our loved ones, and we could go on from there. But if we really took time to go through each day that listing of things that we're grateful for and have that sense of gratitude, we would find real happiness. We would see how blessed we really are. Also, there's a sense of dependence here, that we depend upon God. Yes, 
we like to sort of plan and take control of things, but there always has to be that childlike sense of dependence. When life gets out of control, when we seem to lose our grip, that's when people give up hope at times. They even despair. Instead, we should realize, as our Lord said, if the Heavenly Father is going to take care of all the birds of the air, all the lilies of the field, he's going to take care of you. So don't worry about this unknown future so much. Sure, make plans, but don't worry about something you can't control, something that hasn't happened yet. Instead, live now in union with God. Share that childlike dependence upon a loving Father who cares for us so much. This poverty of spirit, then, will bring us real happiness. Now, the challenge is, and this is something we try to educate our children in, is carefully not flipping the relationship. We're victims of original sin. We have our weaknesses. And so oftentimes, just like Adam and Eve, we want to flip that relationship and make ourselves God. I'll take control. I'll make my own rules. I'll do my own will. Worse yet, then, we allow a false idol into our life. How easy in our world today, in our community, to think the importance is money, or position, or power, or pleasure, or social relationships. And we flip that relationship, and somehow God falls down here, but so does maybe the spouse, the family members, and everything else. How sad that is, because those false idols will never bring happiness. Ultimately, we can be disappointed, we can lose it all, and we know we leave it all behind in a grave. Only God will bring that beatitude, that real happiness. So the poverty of spirit is recognizing that God loves us so much, and we're called to live in union with him. Now with that, our Lord goes on and he says, blessed are those who mourn. Well, we all mourn in our lifetime, at some point, but how does one deal with it? We look at our world today again. Some people who mourn could end up hopeless, even in despair. Some could turn to some kind of a comfort to solve their mourning, some kind of an addiction. Instead, we mourn with our Lord. After all, when someone dies, as sorrowful as that is, don't we remember the comfort our Lord gave to St. Martha Upon the death of her brother, St. Lazarus, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he should die, will have everlasting life, and I'll raise him up again. Those are powerful words of comfort. Life isn't just here. Life is with our Lord. So if we've lived life with him now, we've died in a state of grace, we will have everlasting life in heaven. Yes, we will mourn for our own sins. But again, rather than despair or think we're wretches, we take comfort in the words of Jesus who said that he would never reject a humbled, contrite heart. Jesus instituted the sacrament of penance. We mourn, too, for the situation of the world at times. We look at our world and we wonder what is going on in this world. And yet... Despite forces of evil around us at work, we take comfort in that our Lord, through his death and resurrection, has conquered suffering, sin, death, evil itself. Jesus will always triumph. So Christian mourning, then, is not without hope. Rather, united with Christ, we find comfort. And with that, a person finds real happiness Then Jesus says, blessed are the meek. Meekness is self-control, not giving into excess, not giving into defect. Self-mastery, that's a real Christian virtue. Yes, it takes God's grace, but to have that self-control, not abusing the good things of this world. This is why when we think of the meek, Jesus says they'll inherit the land. They won't let the land The things of this world take control of their lives. The meek take control of the world. They take control of their lives. And that brings real beatitude. 
true happiness. Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Well, we want our young people especially to know that real satisfaction in life doesn't come from just the pleasures or anything that's consumable. Real happiness, satisfaction, comes when our hearts rest with the Lord. When we find that love for Christ, then we find peace in our heart. We find a satisfaction. We'll also want to know more. So we want to know more of our Lord through our prayer, through our participation at Mass, through the graces of the sacrament, through the readings of Scripture, through the teaching of our faith. All of this is the way we satisfy that hunger, that thirsting that we all have. When we find that satisfaction with Christ, we find happiness. And then Jesus says, blessed are the merciful. So we want our young people to do those good corporal and spiritual works of mercy. All of us know, as St. Francis said, it's in giving that we really receive. When we give of ourselves to help others, that's when we receive much joy, true happiness. But there's also another point here, the idea of mercy, to put a limit on evil. We could always look at the hurts that we receive in life, and we all do. And we look at our world today, and we see acts of vengeance, retaliation, whether it's something physically violent or something even on Facebook, the cyberbullying idea. But instead, by forgiving, we put a limit on that evil. The devil would always want us to keep that wound open. The devil would want to remind us and live in that past event to cripple the present blessedness of now. The devil wants us to have the grudge, the hatred, the seeking of vengeance and retaliation. Instead, it's the mercy that our Lord showed to us that allows us to forgive and to put that limit on evil and move forward. Then Jesus said, blessed are the clean of heart. Sometimes this is translated the single-hearted, the pure of heart. So we want to be instructed in keeping our conscience pure, not acting with a perspective of life that's filled with prejudice, suspicion, negativity, or pessimism. We don't want to look at life and have an intention of manipulation or duplicity. We want to be good, integrated Christians, Christians who really witness to the life of Christ because in so doing people see Christ in us but ultimately as our Lord said we will behold the face of God in heaven Jesus said blessed are the peacemakers well we hear a lot about peace in our world today but what we want is to know what is real peace well peace isn't the absence simply of turmoil Peace isn't simply some superficial quick fix. Peace is a result of knowing truth, living that truth, because only then can we have justice, doing what is right, and only then can we have real peace. So we want especially to teach our young people truth and to put that truth into action, because only then will we find peace in our lives, in our families, even in our neighborhood. And lastly, Jesus said, blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Well, my brothers and sisters, if we really live these beatitudes and we're really striving, struggling to live them and to integrate them in our lives, we'll face persecution. We'll be rejected. We know that there are martyrs in every age of the church. There's martyrs right now in Iraq, in Syria. We may be martyrs in the sense of being rejected because we don't do the politically correct thing. So be it. Rejoice. We're known as a Christian. Better to have that happiness of knowing I'm a Christian than to be a fraud. When the apostles, Peter and John, right after Pentecost, preached in the temple that Jesus is truly the Messiah, the risen Lord and Savior, 
they were brought to court. The Jewish leaders told them never to speak of this again, had them whipped, but they left rejoicing that they had been found worthy of professing their faith to the name of Christ. And that's the way we should be. We want to be true Christians, not frauds, Christians who live the Beatitudes. So this is really a paradigm of life, a formula for finding real happiness in this world as well as in heaven. To put it all together, one of the individuals who is up for canonization right now is named Father Solanus Casey. I never knew him until I was at Marymount teaching years ago, and one of the professors there talked to me about his devotion to Father Solanus, whom he knew growing up in Detroit. Now, Father Solanus was born in 1870, died in 1957, so not too long ago. He is one of 14 children, so as a young man, he had to work hard to help support his family. By the time he was 27, he wanted to become a priest. He entered the Franciscans. He found studies very difficult, so when he was ordained, they ordained him at what back then was called a priest simplex, meaning he could offer mass, but he could not hear confessions. He could not preach. So he ended up doing things like taking care of the sacristy and even opening the door. Well, rather than lose his happiness over all of this and just live as the victim with all kinds of disappointment and so on, he bloomed where he was planted. So he was in Harlem, New York, then in the last 20-some years of his life, he is back in Detroit. But there, he would open the door and people would come, sometimes seeking food or some other assistance. Some would come just to talk. And by the end of his life, like 12 hours a day, he was opening the door and just greeting people. And he would give advice. He would pray with people. He would pray for people. Eventually, lists of cures were happening because of his intercessory prayer. Miracles that could not be explained. Father Benedict Grishel, who was a great spiritual writer, died not too long ago, as a young friar, knew Father Solanus in Detroit. And Father Benedict said that one night he went to the chapel to pray, and he noticed that in front of the tabernacle kneeling was Father Solanus. But Father Solanus was like a foot above the floor. He was like in this mystical, ecstatic levitation. Holy man! And people saw him as a happy man, a man who was filled with the love of the Lord. Well, the story goes that this one lady had been coming to Father Solanus because her son, who's now grown up, who had done very well in life, become very wealthy, had lost the faith, left the church, started drinking too much, started womanizing, and was very abusive, even to the mom. So she prayed and prayed, and she encouraged her son to go see Father Solanus. So one night, the young man, who was not sober, was banging on the friary door. So Father Solanus opened the door, and the young man said to him, Are you Father Solanus? He said, Yes, I am. He said, Well, stop meddling with my life. Stop talking to my mother. Leave me alone. I'm fine the way I am. And Father Solanus said, Then why are you so unhappy? And the man paused, his head went down, and he started to cry. Well, Father Solana sat down with him, gave him some coffee, and then said, come back in the morning when you feel better. Well, the man did. So he came back in the morning, and they sat down, and they went through the Beatitudes, just like we did. Went through a real reflection. And the man then went to confession to another friar, but he changed his whole life. He saw that Father Solanus offered a happiness through the Beatitudes that he wanted to have. Changed his life, came back to church, used his wealth to do great good, eventually married, had his own family, and really lived the faith. Father Solanus died in 1957. There were 8,000 people at his funeral. What a happy man. And my brothers and sisters, that's what we want to be too. If we're looking for real happiness, look no further than the Beatitudes. Take time this week to go through them each day. Memorize them. 
because they're just as important as the Ten Commandments. I guarantee you, and this is what we hope to instill in our school children, live the Beatitudes. You'll find happiness because you'll find Jesus. And when we have Jesus, we'll always be happy. May God bless you.